Good evening. Tonight's programme is about Alfred Hitchcock's British films, the first films of his career. Before he became the master of suspense, he made all kinds of movies, learning his profession and honing his technique. His later, much-loved American pictures are full of visual sequences which owe a huge debt to his early days as a silent film director. Alfred Hitchcock was born in 1899 in Leytonstone. He died in 1980. In between, he became the most famous film director in the history of the motion picture. But why put up with a mediocre impersonation when we have the great man himself? Mr. Hitchcock, would you say that your films were more or less sensational than real life? Life is more sensational. I would say that, uh, uh, how does one describe drama? Drama is life with a dull bit cut out. Alfred Hitchcock is a very well documented filmmaker. But his British period before he went to Hollywood is often overlooked. He made 23 films here before going to America. But let's not run ahead of ourselves. When Alfred Hitchcock was six years old, the family moved to Limehouse in the east end of London, just a stone's throw away from where Jack the Ripper had carried out a series of brutal killings only 11 years before Alfred was born. His parents were Catholic, that's Alfred Hitchcock's, not Jack the Ripper's. And being Catholic in those days was a minority religion in Protestant England. I was brought up in a Catholic household and sometimes it does lead to the feeling of being a bit of an outsider. Schoolboy contemporary of the young Alfred, Ambrose King, described the young Hitchcock as a big boy who sat in the corner. He said little and was not easily engaged in conversation. He stank of fish. Perhaps there is a whiff of autobiography about this on-screen cameo in blackmail. Here Alfred is being bothered by a child. Another incident in Alfred Hitchcock's childhood has attained legendary status. The story that he relied on as the all-purpose explanation of his interest in crime and his fear of figures of authority and so on was that uh, once his father, who seems to have been quite firm and intimidating in himself, I think, um, once it had done something that he didn't approve of. And so he wrote a little note and sent him down to the police station with it, because the sergeant was a mate of his. And the note apparently said, could you put him in a cell for five minutes? Then uh, when he was released, the policeman said to him, that's what happens to naughty boys. <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock's fear of the police would have made an identity parade an absolute nightmare for him. If you think Alfred Hitchcock's head on a penguin makes him look like a Jesuit priest, then there's a good reason for this. He was educated by Jesuits. Mr. Hitchcock, what influence would you say your Jesuit training had on your filmmaking? I think it taught me some aspects of fear. 
I think the Jesuits are pretty, I hate to use the word hard-boiled educators, but as far as I can remember, I was pretty scared when I was there. This is a ferula. Like Alfred Hitchcock, I too went to a Jesuit school, so I'm more than familiar with this. The cruel psychological aspect of the ferula was that you were allowed to choose your own time of punishment, be it mid-morning, lunchtime, or after school. So you can try and find out which teacher was administering the punishment at those particular times. I was once ordered six of these, three on each hand, for forgetting my maths homework. I left it at home, having worked all night on it, and then forgot to bring it in with me the next day. But despite this small but deep trauma, I offer a fair and balanced view of the world of the Jesuit. Alfred escaped the miseries of school with regular trips to the theatre. <laughs> three momentous events occurred in Alfred Hitchcock's life. Firstly, the First World War started, then Alfred left school and joined the engineering firm Henley's, and then his father died. There is no connection between these three events. At Henley's, the young Alfred came into his own. He'd been a bit of a loner as a boy, but at the engineering firm, he joined in all the social events, and in fact, here's a rare glimpse of the young Alfred enjoying a river trip on this very river. This photograph was taken in 1919. His boss later said of Alfred, he was a natural humorist and clown. He had a sparkling wit, but it was not only the things he said, but the spontaneous and unexpected things he did. Mr. Hitchcock, were you a keen moviegoer at this time? I was a very keen moviegoer. And I heard that an American company were coming to London to open a studio. So I applied for the job of designing their titles because those were the silent days. And uh, titles were an important part of the picture. He went to get a job of uh, drawing the titles, like and the sunset, and he would draw the sun setting and so on and so forth. And when he went over there, and my mother said she saw this young man come in with this big portfolio, and but she didn't speak to him because uh, he didn't have a job, and in those days. Uh, uh, gentleman didn't talk to a lady, especially if she had a better job than he did. So that's where they met, was at the studio. Alma Revel, born a day after Alfred in the same year, had entered the film business in 1915 at the age of 16. Alma was already a bit further up the rungs of mm. the film ladder, because she was a film editor. I mean, in, the, in those days they called it a script girl, mm. but uh, what the script girl did was not only record what was shot, but also put the films physically together. Alfred swiftly progressed from title card designer to art director. Michael Balkan, a man fresh to film production, opened up a studio called Gainsborough in 1923. He was so impressed by the young Alfred Hitchcock, he made him an assistant director on Gainsborough's first film, Woman to Woman. Finally promoted to a position of some power, Alfred Hitchcock surprised a colleague with the offer of editing the film. The colleague's name was Alma Revel. She also worked as a screenwriter. Her knowledge and experience in film proved invaluable to Alfred. 
he quickly learned to rely on her judgment and expertise. In 1924, Michael Balkan had signed a deal with Ufa, the prestigious German film company. Alfred was sent to Berlin with the director Graham Cutts to film The Blackguard. In many respects, German silent cinema was far in advance of Hollywood. There was greater experimentation with lighting and also expressionistic sets. I had acquired a strong German influence by working at the Ufa Studios Berlin in their heyday. Tremendous technical achievements they were doing. And Yannings, they were working uh, on Yannings' Last Laugh when I was there. The director of The Last Laugh, F.W. Munau, was a keen advocate of the moving camera. This wasn't easy at a time when cameras were so heavy. Here he puts a camera in a lift. Murnau once said that what you saw on the set did not matter. What counted was what you saw on the screen. These cars in the background are miniatures designed to create a false perspective of a massive street scene. Before the invention of the zoom lens, there was only one way to get this shot. The move back from the street musician was actually achieved by mounting the camera on a purpose-built cable car. Alfred Hitchcock would be influenced by the visual inventiveness of German silent cinema throughout the rest of his career. Having returned from Berlin, relations between Hitchcock and his director Graham Cutts became very strained. Mr. Hitchcock, perhaps another reason for the tension was that you were working as an assistant director, an art director. Did you break into Graham Cutts' territory? Oh, I not only broke into his territory, I gave him this shot from where they should be taken. I built the set in such a way you couldn't take it from any other angle. Hitchcock designed this stairway to heaven set for the blackguard. Balkan had recently brokered a deal with a Munich-based firm called Emilka, and Hitchcock got the job of directing their first co-production, The Pleasure Garden. This was the first of ten silent films that Alfred Hitchcock would direct. Immediately, it shows two of his enduring themes. Voyeurism. and a love of theatre. Alma Revel was hired as assistant director and editor. She was also an invaluable support. After every take, Alfred would turn to her and say, was it all right? My mother and father had a marvellous relationship because they, um, they worked together as, as well and he never made, even to the end, he never made a move without her. Uh, he would, if he, he would find a story, he would bring it home, have her read it. If she thought it would make a picture, he'd go ahead. If she said no, it won't, he didn't even touch it. He had, uh, uh, she had an unerring judgment. He went right along with her judgment, and that was from the very beginning. The Pleasure Garden opened to rave reviews. The Daily Express headline described him as the young man with a master mind. The film also benefited from a screenplay by the hugely experienced writer, Elliot Stannard, who would co-write the majority of Hitch's silent films. Hitchcock's second film, The Mountain Eagle, is now lost. But his third film, The Lodger, was a huge success. The Lodger was based on a very popular novel by Mrs. Belloc Lowndes. Hitch was a big fan of the book, which was about the true life horror of Jack the Ripper. Ivan Novello plays a mysterious stranger whose odd behaviour threw suspicion upon him. That 
that's the visual interpretation of the missing sound of those things. In other words, a man is pacing a room up and down today. Uh, we do it by sound and you will see the chandelier shaking. Well, the substitute for that was a visual impression of the room above and you saw the soles of his shoes and the full length of his body and the ceiling of the room beyond as he paced up and down. And I did it by having a floor made of one inch thick glass. Shots inspired by German Expressionism severely worried the money men who thought the film was too arty. When I had finished The Lodger, the director that I had been working for was looking at the rushes and reported to the producer. He said, I don't know what the devil is shooting. I don't understand a word of it. And finally came an afternoon when the big shot was coming down to verify his menial's verdict on the picture. And I remember my wife and I walked out of the studio um, and went for two hours, we found ourselves at Tower Bridge. I said, well, it must be over by now, let's go back. <laughs> Hoping, of course, this is the most suspenseful moment I've ever had, to go back and find smiling faces, it's all right, he likes it. But not a bit of it, he confirmed it, and uh, they put the film on the shelf. Stayed on the shelf for about two or three months. They said, well, we have an investment in this, We'll take a look at it again, and they finally agreed to show it. And then it was acquired as the greatest British film made to that period. So there you see the fine line between failure and success. Although the film was successful, there is a problem with the title role. Ivan Novello is no one's idea of a vicious serial killer. In The Lodger, with his back to the camera, Hitchcock makes the first of his cameo appearances. Alma herself makes a brief appearance too, her first and last in a Hitchcock film. On December the 2nd, 1926, Alfred Hitchcock and Alma Revel celebrated a Roman Catholic wedding at Brompton Oratory. They honeymooned in Paris, Lake Como and Saint Moritz. They would visit these same places virtually every Christmas for the rest of their lives. Alfred's next film was another Ivan Novello vehicle called Downhill. If Hitch was worried about the 34-year-old Novello playing a teenager, he must have had kittens at the sight of the supporting cast. The opening of Hitch's 1927 film The Ring is a marvellous montage of fairground images which creates a very modern sense of movement and atmosphere. Montage was a Russian theory of filmmaking that was very much admired by Hitchcock. Montage means the assembly of pieces of film which moved in rapid succession before the eye create an idea. Here is an extreme example of Russian montage from the film Man with a Movie Camera. Secondly, montage could also be used to illustrate the passing of time. As the boxer climbs up the bill, notice how the seasons change. Now the third way is the assembly of film to create a different idea. Now we have a close up. Let me show what he sees. Let's assume he saw a woman holding a baby in her arms. Now we cut back to his reaction to what he sees. And he smiles. Now what is he as a character? He's a kindly man. He's sympathetic. Now, let's 
take the middle piece of film away, the woman with the child, but leave his two pieces of film as they were. Now we'll put in uh, a piece of film of a girl in a bikini. He looks, girl in a bikini, he smiles. What is he now? The dirty old man. He's no longer the benign gentleman who loves babies. That's the difference. That's what film can do for you. For The Ring, Alfred Hitchcock teamed up with cameraman Jack Cox, who specialised in all kinds of trick photography. Here we see what a drunk sees. In his 1928 film Champagne, Alfred Hitchcock experimented with a camera lens placed in a giant champagne glass. At the end of filming, Alfred had a genuine cause for celebration. Patricia Alma Hitchcock was born. Across the Atlantic, Hollywood was also giving birth to talkies. The huge success of Warner Brothers' film The Jazz Singer, which featured Al Jolson singing and ad-libbing some dialogue, spelt death to the silent film. Did the coming of sound bother you in any way? No, yeah, it didn't bother me at all. I just, uh, just took to it like a... I won't say a duck takes to the water, unless it was sound, I'll say, as the ducks takes to a quack. Alfred Hitchcock was in the middle of making blackmail, but he faced a major dilemma with his female star. Annie Andra spoke with a thick Czechoslovakian accent, mainly because she was Czechoslovakian. Hitchcock arranged a voice test at the studio to see how her voice recorded. Miss Andra, you asked me to let you hear your voice on the talking picture. <laughs> but Hitch, you mustn't do that. Why not? Well, because I can speak well. Do you realize the squad van will be here any moment? No, really. Oh, my God, I'm terribly frightened. Why? Have you been a bad woman or something? Well, not just bad, but... But you slept with men. Oh, no! You have not come here. Stand in your place, otherwise... It will not come out right, as the girl said to the soldier. That's enough. This brief glimpse illustrates the studio atmosphere that was common during a Hitchcock picture. Blackmail began as a silent film, but Hitch was clearly ahead of the game. He'd already planned to put talking sequences into Blackmail. Well, the main problem concerned the fact that I had uh, a Czech film star playing the part of an English girl. So there the problem cropped up. How do we get around the problem of Miss Andra speaking with a heavy foreign accent? Now, in those days, we couldn't substitute voices with the ease with which we do today. So I had a young actress, Joan Barry, sitting on the side with her own microphone while Miss Andra, on the set, playing her scene, just mouthed her words. So the girl on the side had to follow her very closely. You were just caught and yard. We went for Edgar Wallace. Nobody ever heard of it. Uh, funny, aren't you? Anyway, what's the hurry? We're only going to the pictures. We got all evening. Well, I don't think I want to go to the pictures. Oh, and why not? I've seen everything worth seeing. This is a very difficult thing to pull off. For example, here I am miming to somebody else's voice. The effect can be surprisingly convincing. Oh, oh hello, Joe? No! 
No, she didn't. I can't talk now. I'll be home around eight or sooner if this idiot gets it right. Yeah, yeah. Love you. <laughs> Although sound was inevitable, Hitch was not about to abandon the visual style he had so carefully honed. Blackmail stage is a climax in a landmark location, in this case the British Museum. This was soon to become a Hitchcock trademark. If we think of the Royal Albert Hall and the man who knew too much, the London Palladium and the 39 Steps, North by Northwest, of course, Mount Rushmore, and the fruit and vegetable market, Covent Garden in Frenzy. Blackmail was based on the stage play of the same name by Charles Bennett, but Alfred Hitchcock felt the third act was weak. It was the young Michael Powell, himself a few years away from becoming a noted film director in his own right, who came up with the idea of staging the final chase in this very room. Okay. It's not me you want. It's him. Ask him. Why, he don't... Blackmail was a huge hit. Its combination of visuals and dialogue made it Britain's first successful sound film. With the advent of sound, the camera suddenly stopped moving. It now had to be placed in a soundproof booth so that the noise of the camera wouldn't be picked up by the new microphones. And also the lights had to be changed. The old lights in silent days made a humming noise. The new lights were much hotter. So you can imagine the working conditions for a cameraman inside one of these booths. It was, well, it was probably akin to... And when you had the difficulty of recording live music... It's like you didn't bring a piano. What were the working conditions like in those booths? Awful. They were full of air wigs, and um, operators used to break wind <laughs> for fun. <laughs> oh, God. And, uh, and laugh when they got out of mm. the chair, and you'd be dead. They were pretty awful, really. And uh, you'd shoot 14,000 feet of film. Mm. In one day, I mean, you know, it was the only time to take me a foot. But, uh, and there were a lot of mistakes with sound. Awful lot, so a lot of retakes. Mm. When you say mistakes, but people were bumping into microphones and, and they're just generally not used to sound equipment being there. And shadows, mm. shadows of lights and microphones. Which, which they hadn't had to worry about before, had they? Never had to worry about. Can you give us an example of the difficulties of working with early sound? Um, I had a scene in the following film after Blackmail, which was Juno and the Peacock, with the Irish players. And the family had uh, come into the room, they bought a phonograph and they were playing a record, If You're Irish, Come Into the Parlour. And then there was a choir, they stopped the record. The dialogue indicates there's a funeral procession going by. 
and singing these uh, Catholic hymns. And it was a close-up of the son, the guilty son, who had betrayed his friend. Now, they couldn't find a record if your eyes come into the parlor, so in one corner of this tiny studio, we had an orchestra with no bass to get the tinny effect. The prop man sang the song by holding his nose to get, the, again, the thin voice. The rest of the characters played their dialogue. Then in another corner of the studio was a choir for singing in the procession. And there was more room taken up by the effects and the work by the camera and the, and the individual being photographed. A very young John Lowy here at the beginning of his film career. In the 1930 picture Murder, Alfred Hitchcock employs a theatre technique new to film. Here he records Herbert Marshall's internal monologue, an ingenious use of sound. Save her soul. Save her. If I stood up longer, I might have worn them down. Why couldn't they see the girl as I did? The rest of the fellows on the journey. Unusually for Hitchcock, who was a master of the special effect, there is one disastrous moment in the film. He wants to show a character walking through a deep, plush carpet, but instead we get this. Watching murder is sometimes murder. The slow pacing, typical of very early talkies, makes for difficult viewing. Watch how long it takes this actor to leave the room. The two actors by the door have very little to do and lots of time to do it in. Murder is unique because it is Alfred Hitchcock's only whodunit. I've never made a whodunit since. Very simple reason. The whodunit contains no emotion. The audience are wondering. They're not emoting, they're not apprehensive for anyone. When the film is finished and the revelation comes, well, you get two or three minutes of saying, ah, I told you so, or I thought so, or fancy that. Another problem for the early talkies was the rather measured and artificial sounding delivery of many stage trained actors. In the skin game, Jill Esmond, the first Mrs. Lawrence Olivier, is very difficult to listen to, and notice the non-moving camera. Mr. Hornblower never too found that clam put up there at work. Well, that's rather tough in the dangerous, Jill. Like so many early sound films adapted from stage plays, the skin game is overburdened with long static dialogue scenes. But in the auction room scene, Hitch remains true to the idea of the moving camera. Now then, now then, what shall I say? Think of all the possibilities, what shall I say? Two thousand, that won't hurt you, Mr. Spicer. Why, it's worth that to overlook the Duke. For two thousand, for two thousand. Two thousand. Yeah, I can't. Two thousand five hundred. Thank you, sir. Two thousand five hundred. Come, come, Mr. Sandy, don't scratch your head over it. <laughs> Three thousand. Three thousand. <laughs> For this desirable property. Why, you, you think it wasn't desirable? <laughs> Three Come, a little spirit, gentlemen. A little spirit. Three thousand five hundred. Hitchcock's film number 17 was based on a stage play from the mid-1920s. The star from the original production, an eccentric character actor called Leon M. Lyon, does appear in the film version. He plays a cockney type that no longer really exists. Quite sure you don't know anything about that? What, me? Good. 
Number 17 is a bizarre film, and at times Hitchcock is clearly having great fun at the expense of the original play. In this film, fist fighting goes on forever. The most effective part of the film is the final chase. These shots of a model bus and train are made with far greater care than the rest of the film put together. When you saw number 17 again recently, what, what, did, what did you think of the film? Man, so sort of magic. We had this eight miles of track, and I remember my last shot, I was tied off ankle to ankle from the top with the camera, and we were going a little bit too fast, we weren't slowing down, and I thought, where's the next low bridge, because I'm on the top here, and I'm tied off. So I shouted down below to the kids, my assistants, and I said, will you pull the left? cord <laughs> and I said I don't know where we're going mm. and Jack Cox was on the foot plate so he went and pulled the cord and the train stopped and he stopped about uh, 300 yards from a low bridge which would have cut me in half wow. Waltzes from Vienna is just about the worst film that Alfred Hitchcock ever made. At this period of time, my reputation wasn't very good. A film about the Blue Danube, starring popular musical actress Jessie Matthews, was unlikely to bring out the best in Hitchcock. But by 1934, what was the best of Alfred Hitchcock? Blackmail, his first big hit of the sound era, had been nearly five years before in 1929, and since then he'd made a series of talking pictures which were more or less adaptations of popular stage plays of the day. His cinematic art had barely developed at all, if we discount the marvellous chase sequence at the end of number 17, and with his film in 1934, Waltzes from Vienna, it could be argued that his cinematic technique was going backwards. Alvin Hitchcock's career was in crisis. But then the Hitchcocks began a new collaboration with the writer Charles Bennett. The resulting screenplay, The Man Who Knew Too Much, also benefited from discussions with other like-minded professionals at the Hitchcocks flat in Cromwell Road. The master of suspense was born. <laughs> Peter Lorre, star of Fritz Lang's controversial film about a child killer, M, was imaginatively cast as the villain of the piece. The early Germanic and Russian influences are integrated into one coherent style, and the Hitchcock movie as we know it has arrived. An assassination is about to take place in the Albert Hall. This climactic scene is played without dialogue. When you choose a location, it must not be a background. The goings-on in that location must be involved in the story. For example, and the assassination which is about to take place when the symbols crash, that's the time for the shot to go off. The lead 
Some bounds that separated the man who knew too much from its immediate predecessors was carried on with the release of the 39 steps. Charles Bennett, Alfred and Alma fashioned an incredible screenplay. Richard Hannay is on the run from both the police and foreign spies. She was killed by a foreign agent who was interested too. Did she tell you what the foreign agent looked like? It wasn't time. Oh, there was one thing, part of his little finger was missing. Which one? This one, I think. Sure it wasn't this one? As well as dramatically improving his screenplays, Hitchcock also paid meticulous attention to how each shot would look. These drawings by Hitchcock show how closely the set designer followed his instructions. What more did you pull the communication cord? To stop the train, you old fool. It's against all the regulations to stop the train on the bridge. And an end of them. He's a madman. The film is one long pursuit. Action sequences take place in iconic locations. Jumping off a train on the fourth bridge. Solving the mystery of the 39 steps at the London Palladium. And the cast is superb. Even small roles are impeccably handled. The milkman is played by Frederick Piper. It's quite true, isn't it? They're spies, foreigners. They murdered a woman in my flat and now they're waiting for me. Oh, come off it. Funny jokes at five o'clock in the morning. All right, all right. I'll tell you the truth. You married? Yes, but don't rub it in. On the first day of filming, Hitch handcuffed the two stars, Madeleine Carroll and Robert Donat, together and then pretended to lose the key. This was a practical joke enabling his actors to experience the difficulty of being handcuffed to a near stranger. I tell you, I can't stand it any longer. I'm going to tell them the whole story. You want to hang me for a murder never committed? As long as they hang you, I don't care whether you committed it or not. Don't let me go! Do you think I'm going to spend the whole night with you in this room? Of course you are. What else can you do? Go on. Come in. Oh, we were just getting warm before the fire. <laughs> I can see that. I thought maybe you'd like this in your bed, sir. Oh, thank you very much. You'd like a hot water bottle, wouldn't you, my sweet? Yes, darling. Yes, darling. This man's to be questioned by the Shadow Prince. At one point, there is a lovely camera effect that you hardly notice. This scene is shot in the studio, showing passengers inside a supposedly moving car with back projection. Hitch then uses the black canvas of the car to cut to an exterior shot of the Scottish Highlands. London ladies look beautiful. They do, but they wouldn't if you were beside them. You ought not to say that. What ought you not to say? Richard Hannay seeks refuge in an isolated cottage. The wife is played by Peggy Ashcroft, the husband by John Laurie. I was just saying to your wife that I prefer living in town than the country. God made the country. Is the supper ready, woman? Right. You mind if I have a look at your paper? No, I don't mind. Thank you. Hitch develops the scene in purely visual terms. You didn't tell me your name. No, oh, Helen. Well, Mr. Hammond, if you're fit doing that paper, I'll see you have a listen. Yes, of course. Sanctify these bounteous mercies to us miserable sinners. O oh Lord, make us truly thankful for them and for all thy manifold blessings. And continually turn our hearts from wickedness and from worldly things unto thee. Amen. Repeating the success of The Man Who Knew Too Much, Hitchcock stage is another tense finale in a well-known London landmark, The Palladium. What is the height of the Empire 
Oh, you're Richard Hanley. Listen, there's something you ought to know. Oh, Hanley, come along quietly. Yes, but look here, that man on the stage. Hey, look here, old man. You don't want to cause any trouble and spoil people's entertainment. Where's the handful of men? What are the 39 steps? Come on, answer up. What are the 39 steps? The 39 steps is an organization of spies collecting information on behalf of the Foreign Office of... <laughs> In his next picture, Secret Agent, Hitch was reunited with the actor Peter Lorre, who since they'd last worked together had developed an addiction to morphine. Can you spot it in his acting? Oh, he's on! Oh, he's terrible! What a man! This is awful! This is too much! Really too much! For you, beautiful woman! And what for me? What for me? Nothing! Nobody, nothing! No, this! Caramba, the Caramba! Caramba! The actor is not doing a very good job, and Hitchcock is, is said to have turned to the unit and said, I bought him in the shop, put him on the floor, wound him up, and he doesn't go. <laughs> Peter Lorre, like Alfred Hitchcock, was a great practical joker. During the course of the filming, he sent the director 50 canaries. Unfortunately, relationships soured between them, and at one point, Alfred threw a cup of coffee over Peter Lorre. On other, happier occasions, Hitch was rather fond of the practical joke. He would throw his cup and saucer into the air to signify the end of the tea break. In Sabotage, Hitchcock made a dreadful mistake that would haunt him for decades. A boy is carrying a bomb on a bus but doesn't know it. Neither does the puppy. I once committed a grave error in having a bomb from which I extracted a great deal of suspense. And I had the thing go off, which I should never have done, because they needed the relief from their suspense. Clock going, the time for the bomb to go off is such a time, and I drew this thing out and uh, attenuated the whole business, then somebody should say, oh my goodness, look, there's a bomb. Pick it up, throw it out the window, bang! But everybody's relieved. Well, I made the mistake, I, I, let, I let the bomb go off and kill someone. Bad technique. Despite this rare error, there are many flourishes that are typical of the former silent film director. When Sylvia Sidney realises her husband is responsible for the bomb that killed her brother, no dialogue is needed.
actress Sylvia Sidney was originally disturbed by the lack of dialogue in this crucial scene. However, when she saw the complete sequence, she said with great admiration, Hollywood must hear of this. Hitch was indeed keen on a move to Hollywood. He wanted his films to be seen on the world stage. His next picture, Young and Innocent, was full of imaginative and confident use of the moving camera. <laughs> Your daughter Tio's in here, but then stay here long. What sugar that beer? In this situation, you have a young girl with a hobo, a tramp, you see, and he's the only man who could identify this murderer. And all I know is that he has some brighter starts in the eyes. Haven't you seen anyone with a twitch yet? And the old boy said, well, this is idiotic. In a big room like this, trying to find a man who has twitching eyes. And at that moment, I take the camera high up into the lobby of the hotel and do the longest dolly shot through the lobby, through the ballroom, through the dancers. I'm right here to tell you, sister, no one can like the drama man. Every man who plays in the band is wonderful too. I've got to give credit where credit is due. But when it comes to make that music up, make you give it all it's got, I'm right here to tell you, mister. Through a minstrel blackface band. Right through the band to the drummer, to his head, and right to his eyes. This is another variation of letting the audience in on something. Hitchcock's following picture is among his best remembered. The Lady Vanishes. Although he had very little to do with the excellent screenplay, which was written by the celebrated team Frank Launder and Sidney Gilliatt. Hitch was reunited with the cameraman Jack Cox, as these trick shots indicate. The film director Roy Ward Baker worked on The Lady Vanishes and remembers observing Hitchcock on the set. His method of work was so carefully uh, uh, worked out that, uh, that everybody was well informed. Mm. This was one of his great gifts which I, I took to heart. When you're giving instructions to people, which the director is doing all the time, then you must know what you want, which is the first step. Mm. A lot of them don't. <laughs> they say, well, I, I wonder what we should do here. I mean, you know, that's what you... Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> well, that wouldn't do for the likes of Mr Hitchcock. You know, he, but he wasn't overbearing or, or in any way rude. He was always very courteous, in fact, and scrupulous. The Lady Vanishes was filmed in a tiny studio, but it feels far bigger. Hitch achieved this effect with back projection and beautifully constructed model shots. The other trick thing that he got up to uh, was over a glass of wine. There's a scene in the restaurant hall, and he wanted to get a shot with the glass of wine very strong in the foreground with, there was some problem in those days of carrying focus between the two you could have it with a blurred glass mm. or, or, with or, or, or so yeah. anyway he thought up the idea that this, the problem was the size of the glass which was a normal wine glass mm. he thought well if we make one which is t twice the size which he did Somebody rang up and, and got some glass manufacturer to do a duplicate, but except twice the size. And he stood that in the foreground, and then it gave him the dramatic impact mm. that he wanted. Mm.
The Lady Vanishes enhanced his reputation in America. It wasn't long before the Hitchcock family moved to the States. Everything he had learned as a British filmmaker was to help him conquer Hollywood. Here at the banquet for the 1940 Academy Awards, Alfred Hitchcock deliberately places his head in front of Joan Fontaine, making Alma roar with laughter. Throughout his Hollywood years, Hitch would remain loyal to the visual image always taking precedence over dialogue. In 1971, towards the end of his career, Alfred Hitchcock returned to London to make one last British picture. Alfred Hitchcock by this time was in his early 70s and he relished the chance of coming back to make another film in London. Frenzy begins with the discovery of a dead body beside the Thames, just as the lodger had begun nearly 50 years before. What's up on the neck? She's been strangled. Looks like a tie. Yes, it's a tie, all right. Another necktie murder. Frenzy was shot here in Covent Garden. Then it was London's premier fruit and vegetable market. Entirely appropriate, of course, for Alfred Hitchcock to make a film here after all his father had been a greengrocer. The building behind me, the one with the dark brick, that's where the murderer lived. Well, some terrible things happened in there. To create tension in one scene with actress Anna Massey, Hitchcock completely kills the sound. Got a place to stay. Oh, I know, it's you, Bob. Yeah. Well, I think the scene, particularly the scene when you first come out of the pub and then, of course, you're, 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 unbeknownst, you're following Barry Foster to your doom and you go up the stairs and you go through the door and then it's chilling. I don't know if you know it, Babs, but you're my type of woman. I just love the beauty of the camera just then coming away from the door, because we've seen the horrendous scene earlier, so we don't need to see any more no. horrors. At the entrance to the street, Hitch employs an elaborate camera trick. Could you explain how it was done? We had the man in the potato, carrying a potato sack in Covent Garden, in situ. And we had him brought back to the studio where the staircase was rebuilt and he decided to put this scene in. It was not scripted in the original script and it took a whole day to do. And it comes back right down onto the pavement where you have the man with the potato sack in the studio and you also have him in Covent Garden mm. he did the cut there. Because Alfred Hitchcock specialised in films filled with suspense, he has sometimes been portrayed as a sadistic man who had a strange obsession with the darker side of life. Like all of us, he was light and shade, but he always believed that filmmaking should be fun, and he was a very funny man. Shall we invite some questions from the audience yes, on yes, what we've yes, discussed sir. so far? Um, take the first one down there, sir. Mr Hitchcock. In your latter career, you've concentrated more on thrillers. Do you hanker to make other types of film? 
Well, no, it's not for me. It's a, it's the uh, it's the public. You see, if I made, for example, a musical, uh, the public would wonder when will the moment come when one of the when one of the uh, chorus girls will drop dead. <laughs> In the train of a frenzy, Hitchcock is characteristically macabre. Hey, what's wrong? Look, he's wearing my tie. How do you like my car? How do you like it? I don't. Mr. Hitchcock, as we are coming to the end of our documentary, would you care to make a random vowel sound? No. Mr. Hitchcock, thank you for taking part in this documentary. It, it's been an absolute pleasure. Delighted. Alfred Hitchcock used these vast, expansive areas to create a large... Let me do it again. In the British Museum, Alfred Hitchcock used these vast, rich locations to create a huge dramatic backdrop. But how did he manage to light these huge rooms at night? Well, he didn't. He used exactly the same technique for the Albert Hall sequences in The Ring and The Man Who Knew Too Much. Oh, that was beautifully put.